Welcome to our third annual State of the City Address. Uh, Lynn Community Association has been bringing this to the people of Lynn for three years now, believe it or not, and we hope to continue it as a tradition throughout the future. Um, I, we know it's a gorgeous day outside and you took your time to be here and we appreciate that. And I would like to um, thank some people for being here today. Of course, our mayor, Judith Flanagan Kennedy, who <laughs> will be giving our address. And we have uh, some other dignitaries in the audience, um, among whom are um, school committee candidate and current committee member, Charlie Gallo. Uh, Seth Album, who is a candidate for Ward 5 Counselor. Rick Starbird, who is a current school committee member and a candidate for re-election. Uh, Jesse Jager, who is a candidate for Ward 2. And Debbie Plunkett, who is a candidate for Ward 1. And Stan Stanley Watring right here, who didn't sign in on the candidate, <laughs> who is also a candidate for school committee. <laughs> we also want to thank our cameramen today. We have Seth Album from uh, Lynn Happens. And we also have Sean Donahue from Lynn Cam. And I have not figured out who the person is here from the item. If you're here from the item, could you uh, let us know who you are? There you go. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. Okay. Um, before we get started on the address, there are a couple of things that I would like everyone to know about. And the next thing that we have coming up, if you haven't already picked it up outside, is a flyer for the Clean Sweep to the Sea, which is coming up this year on June 22nd. It's gonna run in conjunction with the Downtown Lynn Neighborhood Association's Open DTL. And what we do is have teams who adopt a park for the day, go out and clean up that park, and then we will have a tent at Central Square where you can come and have lunch. Or you'll be provided with supplies to do your little cleanup as well as a ticket for lunch. And so those are being provided by a number of sponsors. And just in case you're looking for something to sponsor, we, st <laughs> we still have a few items to cover for that. So just let me know. Also, what we started a few years back, a couple of elections ago, were our candidate forums. And we have found those pretty valuable for people who are looking to make up their mind what candidate they should vote for. We have four this year. The reason being, we've never done the ward counselors before, but this year there are an abundance of challenged seats. So this year we will also have a forum for the ward counselors. The counselor at large uh, forum will be on July 10th. These are all on Wednesdays and they're all taking place here. Uh, and then we have, that's on July 10th, and then the mayoral candidates will be on Wednesday, July 24th, the school committee on August 7th, and the ward counselors on August 21st. Uh, you'll notice also, and I'm going to mention this twice because it's so important, at the bottom of your clean, uh, at your uh, ward council, uh, council, any kind of debate. <laughs> That whole flyer, we just used one piece of paper. We thought we would save some trees. There's a note here that asks you to please come on July the 27th over to the Elhand building at 10 Church Street. We want your blood. In the summertime, <laughs> in the summertime when people go on vacations, 
not so many people go and give blood and the Red Cross gets very low because of the travel involved people do have accidents and you know God forbid we should have another event like we had at the marathon we need to make sure that the blood supplies around the greater Boston area are up to par so we're having this citywide blood drive on July the 27th. It's a Saturday and it's from nine to two. It does not take that long to give blood. I know, cause they always take two bags from me. <laughs> cause I'm O negative. It doesn't take that long. They just take it and then you can go and eat cookies and juice and go on about your day. Uh, then we have a separate flyer that the blood drive, the Red Cross themselves made up for us, which is very nice of them, and they did a very professional job of it. So please, please encourage your family and friends, neighbors, to come out, give blood, and to come out and attend the debates, and to go online and to sign up for the Clean Sweep to the Sea, because we do individual supply bags for these teams and the team members, and you also are going to need a ticket to eat your lunch downtown, so we need to know how many lunches we're providing. So please go online and sign up. There's a list of every park in Lynn on our website. You get to pick it. You get to say whether you'll be a team leader or not, et cetera, et cetera, whether you want a certificate for community service hours. It's all online, and I welcome you to take a look at that. And now, uh, one more thank you. We want to thank the Congregation of Hobbit Shalom for allowing us to use this building for the last four or five years uh, pretty much on demand and they have just been extremely extremely gracious to us and we appreciate that very much and so without further ado I would like to ask our mayor to come forward and take the podium and give us her state of the city address for this year Good afternoon, everybody. I, I want to thank the Lynn Community Association. Can everybody hear me all right? OK. I didn't know if these were amplified or just uh, microphones for the Lynn cam or whatever. OK. Um, I want to thank the Lynn Community Association and Temple Ahabat Shalom for hosting today's State of the City Address, and to all of you who have elected to spend some time indoors on a gorgeous Sunday afternoon. As I stand before you today, I am tempted to go through everything that's changed in the last four years. But I know this is a state of the city and it should be encompassing what has gone on from the most recent state of the city address in June to this current June. So let me um, tell you some of the events that have taken place over the last year in the direction that we're moving. Some people say I do things differently and I'll let you decide at the end of this address whether you think different is a positive or a negative word. Um, for example, today, Lynn is the only city its size in the Commonwealth that has a sizable reserve fund. It started the year at about $16 million. Um, as we stand here today, it's about $5.9 million. And that money has been put to some very good use. Um, we did not spend it immediately. We chose to spend prudently. And it still leaves us on solid financial ground. We had $4.7 million of that used to reduce the tax levy. We had $1.6 million of that to go to school security and some needed repairs and upgrades to the school build buildings. We had $1.7 million of that that went to the breed window re um, replacement program and the tech roof replacement program. We used $1.3 million of that for the eminent domain taking of the Brookline Street properties that will be the future site of the Thurgood Marshall Middle School. And $400,000 of that went to renovate 100 Bennett Street. It's the old IUE hall. We're going to be consolidating all of the school administration offices into that one building so that no, it's one-stop shopping. Right now, if there's a problem with special ed or you need to go visit the fine arts department for whatever reason, you have to go over to Broad Street. They're not even in the tech annex due to lack of room. So this will consolidate all of the school departments under one roof. Today, in one of the worst recessions of our lifetime, 
I'm proud to say that because of our budgetary decisions, our bond rating was upgraded this past fall to an A status with a stable outlook. So uh, we're <laughs> Today, when other cities are struggling with massive layoffs and cuts, I can proudly say to you that we have not laid off anybody for this year's upcoming FY14, nor have we laid off anybody in the past four years. Um, our police force has increased from 161 to 193 today. We have re reinstituted the SRO program in all of the middle schools. Most recently, Fecto Leary was added this past year. The walking patrolmen are in our downtown, and the CLT, those are the bike officers that you see, are in every sector of the city, which means they're in every neighborhood of the city. And they've been put there in order to take care of quality of life issues, somebody who plays the stereo too loud, some kid that guns the motor of his car, and, and those are, they're down on the ground. They get to hear about those things, and it allows the regular patrol cars to go about their business as well. Additionally, our fire department has grown from 166 uh, uniform personnel four years ago, and now we're at 188, and we intend to be staying right around that 190 area with both the police and the fire. With those additional officers on, there's been a direct correlation with our crime rate. If you look at the 2012 annual report of the Lynn Police Department, um, it is available online. Our crime rate for the past year for part one crimes decreased by 4%. And <laughs> Today, as our crime rate has decreased, people are feeling safe in our city and in our downtown. And you know, all know that we were designated an arts and cultural district, one of the first five in the Commonwealth. That happened just over a year ago. But it's not just the arts and culture that are thriving downtown. Look at the new developments that are happening as we speak in the downtown. Rosetti's, which is a successful restaurant in Winthrop, right on the beach. I don't know, if, have any of you ever eaten there? Okay. <laughs> They're really, really good. And they were looking to site a second location. And when they saw what was happening at the Lynn Auditorium, they approached us. And they have chosen a site on Sutton Street. So we'll be getting yet another re restaurant downtown. That's in addition to Demichi's, who's expanding and putting a bigger kitchen in, in downtown Lynn, right near that Rossetti site. And I also want to let you know that just in the last month or so, North Shore Community College has finalized expansion plans, and they're putting a satellite campus on Union Street downtown with a culinary arts program. And they're hoping to have, thank you. <laughs> They're hoping to use all of us as guinea pigs so that um, they will prepare the food, have their, um, their students train as servers, um, plan the menus, and offer everything at a very competitive price. So while it's technically not a restaurant, it's another place that we can go eat, and who knows, you might be served by the next great chef. Um, today, almost every union contract has been finalized and in place. Uh, for a while, there were some uh, unions like the police and fire that had gone five and six years without a contract. We now, as far as I know, only have one contract left outstanding, and that's for Union 1736, but we are actively negotiating. I expect that to be settled as well, so all of our employees are hopefully content and secure in their contracts. Today, a Lynn child who is looking for a summer job now has an equal chance of getting one. When I took office, it was strictly the good old boys network. If you knew a political insider, then you got a job. Now all of the applicants are put into a lottery, and everybody has a fair chance of getting a summer job. <laughs> oh, Stanley, <laughs> leave him alone. <laughs> and I have to say, a few have still managed to pull strings and get their children summer jobs while bypassing the lottery. I'm not going to name names. But there are still remnants of the old guard out there who simply didn't want to play fair within the system that I implemented. So, as you all know, um, since around the late 1980s, we've seen the GE land sit vacant, 22 acres over there. And as a result of us meeting directly with the GE corporate officials, not staying in Lynn, 
but talking with the New York officials who really decide what is going to happen with GE's real estate portfolio, we were able to get them to put the land on the market. It was bought, um, I think, in a trust by a gentleman named Charlie Patsios from Swamp Scott. He wanted to lease it out in order to put a market basket on there. And Market Basket finalized their deal about a month ago, so pretty soon you will be seeing a Market Basket at the corner of Federal Street and Western Avenue, bounded on the other side by Water Hill Street. <laughs> they are expected to employ almost 500 people. And I know that Market Basket has a corporate policy of employing young people as well. So that can only help the youth find, find more jobs in the city. And many of you may have heard about the most recent addition to the uh, stable of Newland businesses, and that is Kettle Cuisine. They just held an event last week for some of their higher ranking uh, executives in Lynn City Hall Auditorium to introduce them to the city of Lynn and uh, to let them get to know a little bit about their new home. They were in Chelsea, and they simply ran out of room in Chelsea. So when word got out that they were looking to expand, and there were 12 cities that were courting them, I went with the EDIC director, Jim Cowdell, and we reached out to them personally. We rolled out the red carpet. Knocking on, the, on their door and introducing them ourselves to the president of the company, we were able to offer them a tax incentive. And most importantly, we let them know that Lynn is a place that is easy to work with and that we really wanted to, them to come to Lynn. They are investing $20 million in the clock tower building and they're bringing over 100 new jobs to Lynn. They're going to have about a 200,000 square foot manufacturing facility. And like you probably don't know exactly what Kettle Cuisine is, they supply restaurants with their soups. And their, their inside corporate motto is, we've won first, second, third, fourth, and fifth place for best clam chowder at restaurants. So um, everybody just tweaks it, and then their, their stuff gets the top prize. So we've opened the doors to City Hall. Um, we have been trying to make use of online information um, and so that people have a one-stop place to go and look for our, um, anything that they would need to know. And right now, in fact, the proposed budgets for FY14 should be posted on the city's website. We have upcoming public hearings for both the school side budget and the city side budget. And as far as I know, those are up and available for you to review before you go to the public hearing. So you will be able to be informed. Um, we've also been working to help out our seniors who are homeowners. Well, actually some who are not homeowners as well. But on the homeowner side, along with Jamie Cerulli, my chief of staff, who is here today, and Peter Karen, who is the chief of assessing, and Dan Cahill from the city council, we were able to put together a senior tax abatement program so that these seniors can volunteer at a rate of, it's, a, it's not compensable in dollars, but it is compensable in dollars off of their tax bills. So they can work at a rate of $8 an hour to earn up to $600 off of their tax bill, and we figure that is a needed relief for a lot of the senior homeowners who are struggling with so many bills that this is one way the city of Lynn can help to alleviate that and at the same time make use of the knowledge that's out there. When we were looking at some of the applications, we had people that could have taught yoga. There were people that had been in the financial um, side of business their whole lives. Um, we have people that want to be docents over at the GAR. We have people that are going to volunteer over at the library. And I, I use the term volunteer loosely because, as I said, this is something where they are earning money to get, off the, to get money off their tax bills. The other thing we did last July, as you can all remember, the, the RIDE um, and the MBTA raised their fares significantly last July. And Paul Crowley, who is the executive director of GLIS, who works in conjun conjunction with the Lynn Council on Aging to run the Senior Center, came to me and he was afraid that we were going to maybe lose some of the seniors because they wouldn't be able to afford the trip. Four dollars each way times five days a week. Forty dollars a week is pretty expensive for getting down to the Senior Center. And we did not want to lose them and we did not want to have them lose their independence, their ability to socialize. So what we did is the city gave um, the Lynn Council on Aging and GLIS, $17,000 to 
to supplement rides in the afternoon. It's not something that we could offer up to everybody, but for those of the, uh, the seniors who took the ride, they were able to get a full fare ride by the MBTAs the ride in the morning, and then the buses from Gliss volunteered to take them home in the afternoon at no cost. And that was funded by, by some City of Lynn money. So we were able to keep more seniors active in the community, which was so important. As many of you know, I'm a huge proponent of the Lynn City Hall Auditorium. So let me put my plug in. Dog Whisperer, Cesar Milan, coming July 11th. <laughs> the Amazing Creskin, coming October 30th, which uh, for those of you old enough to remember the Johnny Carson show, he's a mentalist. And um, I think October 30th is a perfect night to host him. And also in October, an equally inappropriate time of year, Alice Cooper. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> um, th those are just some of the shows that are coming up. We've also had ZZ Top this year, George Thorogood and the Destroyers. In short, we've gone from two to four shows per year in the auditorium since it was renovated in 2005. From 2005 to 2009, we were doing two to four shows on average per year. In the last four years, we've done 12 to 15 shows a year, and we are now in the final stages of completing the air conditioning. This is going to be a year-round revenue producer for the city of Lynn. <laughs> Can't promise you Cesar Milan is gonna get the air conditioning on July 11th, but um, substantial completion is scheduled for August 1st. And if any of you have been by City Hall, you've seen the crane out there, you might have seen all the duct work out there. They're really moving along and they're doing a very good job. So that will, that was paid for in part with a $241,000 grant from um, the Arts and Cultural Council of Massachusetts. It was a matching grant, so the city gave another 241 on top of that. This $600,000 of it that came out of the bond that I'll be talking about in a little while. But that is not going to be any long-term obligation for, for the citizens of Lynn other than what was included in the bond. We'll be able to benefit from from that air conditioning almost immediately. And the ripple effect that it will have on the downtown restaurants is huge as well. I, I've heard anecdotally from people like George Marcos over at Brothers and, and Matt O'Neill over at the Blue Ox, they can have three or four table turnovers on, on show nights. Um, their revenues go up up to 20% on a show night. So for those that think that the auditorium is my little pet project, it is, it is so much more than that for the city. It really can become an, a hub in the economic wheel um, that is downtown. Still making 82.5 a year, <laughs> which ranks me at about 425th on the city salary list. I'm still waiting to hear the court's decision on, on what the proper salary should be. We um, asked the court actually three years ago for declaratory judgment because the way I read the city of Lynn's ordinances, the last time the mayor's salary was even considered was in 1998, and at that time they set the salary for 82.5. So I, I guess I'm being paid in 1998 dollars. Um, some would say my wardrobe can be 1998 a lot of the time, but you know <laughs> what can you do? But in, until I hear from the court, um, and the summary judgment motions are scheduled to be heard pretty soon, uh, until I hear from them, I'll continue up to abide by, by Lynn's salary ordinance. Just wanted to let you know that. As you know, we have a, a new Chamber of Commerce in town known as the North Shore Latino Business Association. They just celebrated their second anniversary. They had had about, um, 120 members at the end of their 2012 cycle, and they are now up to 200 members. Those are all small businesses, the majority of them from the Lynn area. So I can say with a, a great deal of pride for them that the, the Latino business community has been very strong, very forceful, and it is growing, and that can only be to the benefit of everybody from downtown and beyond. I just got word this past week that the um, Lynn, well, this one was actually a couple months ago. Common Grandstand has a $790,000 renovation that's going to be taking place. It will become handicapped accessible. It will have a lift built into it. It will, 
It will become more stable. Those of you who have gone by it might have seen that we have the orange protective netting up there because we don't want anybody to get hurt on it. If we have some money left over after the grandstand um, design is done, we're looking to put some Victorian lighting back on the common rather than those harsh kind of floodlights that we have out there. Um, also, through Mass in Motion, the health department is going to be putting um, mile markers for walkers so that I think it's going to be every tenth of a mile, it might be every quarter of a mile, there will be markers on the common. And it's all part of a fitness initiative. A lot of it was done by the, the Food and Fitness Alliance here in Lynn. And um, that should help us to, to get a little bit more in shape. How many of you have seen the Barkland Avenue Dog Park? How many of you have had your dog romp in the Barkland Avenue Dog Park? Got to get your, you have to get your admissions, um, get your little tags, because when we started this the first week, people were pretty skepti skeptical when we opened in April. We had eight applicants the first week. By the third week, we were up to 150 applicants. I love going by that dog park, because not only is it being utilized, and it gives the dogs a chance to run off, off leash without being in the woods or without being down at the sea, it, it when you see the people that come together, they all immediately have something in common. They, they are dog lovers, I assume. And I'll see the people clustered. They're not just standing in little separate areas. They are clustering, talking, getting to know their neighbors. And I think that was uh, an unintended but very, very positive consequence of having that dog park in the city. Um, we've been working on doing a lot of paving in the streets. As you may know, we did Franklin Street last year. We did Commercial Street last year. We finally did Union Street after all the work was done. Once um, all of the electrical utility work is done on Broad and Lewis Street, that's one of the next major streets to be done. And um, the Wyoming Square project as well, we're going to have some reconfigurations done over there. And speaking of Wyoming Square, I changed some of the members of the Off-Street Parking Commission because I felt as though we were stuck in a rut with the Off-Street Parking Commission. So um, over the past year, uh, beginning in the fall and continuing through the winter, I gradually had a turnover of personnel at the Off-Street Parking Commission. And it is now, for the first time ever, representative of the people who should be concerned with the Off-Street Parking. Jane Kelly, who many of you may know from Arts After Hours or maybe the Friends of Lynn Woods, she's married to Ranger Dan Small. She has been very involved with downtown businesses and in particular with Arts After Hours. I named her to the commission. She is somebody, if you know her, she will speak her mind. She can't help herself. Um, <laughs> Corey Jackson, I have also named to the downtown off street, uh, to the off street parking commission. Um, he lives downtown. He knows what it's like to try to find a parking space or when you have a friend coming over, but trying to tell them where to, where to go park. Tasso Nicolacopoulos, who um, is just a, a really outstanding member of the Chamber of Commerce. He understands businesses' needs. Um, and Jamie Cerulli, because she's just the best. <laughs> and, and call it nepotism, if you will, but she understands the vision I have for what should be done with these parking lots. We have had the Andrew Street lot looked at for automation. It's only going to cost $10,000, so you should be seeing automation in the Andrew Street parking lot pretty soon. And if any of you have spent time up in Salem at the Church Street parking lot, it will take debit cards, it will take cash, we won't have to have a collector, and it will be a 24-7 source of revenue for the city. Um, well, at least depending on what hours we use, but in, in other words, whether it's manned or not, we will have that revenue coming in. So happy to say that. Uh, that $4 million bond that I referred to earlier, we have some not so glamorous things that were included in that bond and some that are a little more, um, I, I guess they're easier to elaborate on. Some of the boring things. $75,000 of that is going to security over at Lynn City Hall in the form of glass panes on offices that handle cash. Because last summer, we had two incidents in a row, one where uh, a disgruntled taxpayer tried to jump over the counter. And a day later, 
when one of our employees had a personal fan to keep herself cool, somebody grabbed the fan and literally threw it at her. So we decided it was money well worth it. Um, if you've ever been down to the parking department, you know that you have to get buzzed in behind the glass and otherwise everything's handled with a glass barrier between those employees and the public. And we're going to be doing that in the treasurer and collector's office. So um, the other sort of non-glamorous major um, amount that's coming out of there is $250,000 to fix the city hall steps. Now they look good from the outside, but every so often the Commissioner of Inspectional Services, Mike Donovan, needs to go down there and check to see what's going on. And I think in part because of the increased traffic into City Hall with the shows, we have sometimes thousands of people going up and down those steps you know, on any given night. And it's been wearing on it, and the rebar is deteriorating, and Mike tells me that if you look up from underneath, you can see the sky which is not good. So we are undertaking a $250,000 upgrade of the City Hall steps to make it safe for everybody. Um, some of the more fun things that we're doing is every single ward in the city is going to get some benefit out of this bond. A lot of it is going to parks and playgrounds. Um, part of it is going to restrooms over at Lynn Woods because we've had a lot of instances where we want to bring the school children into Lin Linwoods to learn what's out there, but try taking a group of 25 second graders and not have a bathroom available. So some of that money is going to go over there. But the $4 million bond is going to be signed tomorrow. I have to make myself available all day. But we will be able to um, go ahead and start spending that money once that hits, hits the market. Thurgood Marshall Middle School update. Um, it looks right now that the projected opening is going to be September of 2016. The next important steps are the design. We should have the design by the end of July. In October, the Mass School Building Authority, MSBA, is going to be giving a final vote on whether we will be getting 80% reimbursement on this. And there's been some jockeying, political posturing, I don't know what you want to call it, with when the vote is going to be taken because we, as a city, have to approve it um, by a ballot vote. And all of you here, I would strongly urge you to support this, this vote in favor of funding the Marshall Middle School. And even for some of those who don't live in the areas of the city serviced by the Marshall Middle School, our next school in the pipeline is Pickering. I know, my kids went there. <laughs> Believe me, it needs work. But Marshall was worse. Um, and getting Marshall fixed is a prerequisite to getting Pickering into the pipeline. So even though there may not be an immediate and direct benefit for those in Ward 1 and Ward 2, the benefit for you comes after Marshall has been approved, then we can get Pickering going. Um, as I said, we've already taken the land, the $1.3 million taking over on Brookline Street. My understanding is that the meeting of the MSBA is more or less a rubber stamp. So right now, it looks like the vote is going to be held in January of 2014. There are some who would like to have it on the September primary ballot and others that would like to have it on the November final ballot. Um, frankly, I've given up with all the back and forth and, and I don't care when it is held. I just want to stress the importance of having that bond vote pass in the city. And please tell your friends and neighbors the same thing. Over at the library, we have put in a library teen room. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but I was approached this past year by Teresa Hurley, the, the uh, director of the library, and she said, Mayor, you know, we, we lose the kids. We have the children's room, and we have the adult reading rooms, and then the reference for when people need to, to do research and get information up there. But we have no place for the, the teenagers to come and feel like they're welcome. So if you go over to the library now, you'll see she um, received a grant for, for part of it. There's comfortable chairs. There's a computer lab. Um, there are plans to hook it in online to reach out to other libraries that have 
teen rooms like that to, to kind of share ideas. Um, but I think it filled a void in our library services. And I'm so glad that she came to me with that idea. And I have not yet heard back from her as to whether she has a group of regulars that are going there. Or, uh, my guess is it's going to be a huge success. Um, this past week, actually last weekend, did anybody see Abraham Lincoln walking around town? Yes. <laughs> Were you a little confused? <laughs> and if you know your history, you might have seen Ulysses S. Grant, you might have seen General Chamberlain walking around. All of that is a result of our GAR trustees and Bob Mathias, the director of the GAR Museum which also got $100,000 out of that bond money to, to shore up the, the envelope of the building. Um, that was considered a GAR, uh, a GAR signature event, a national event. Um, and they held it here for the second year in a row, which means they must have liked what we were doing to host them. Um, but it brings a little bit of recognition to the city. It brings people in from outside. The, the GAR Museum is opened to anybody who wants to go and view the collection. And I'll tell you, it really is an extraordinary collection for those of you who have not visited GAR, nondescript building on Andrew Street. Bob Mathias will tell you more than you ever wanted to know about it. Um, I still don't have a trash ordinance. I have been waiting since August of 2011. What can I say? Not my department. I did write a draft up and asked if I could have them uh, have the city council use it as a template, but since I'm reporting on what's going on in the city, we do not have a trash ordinance yet. Um, the school committee, for the first time over the last couple of months, held uh, school committee workshops in conjunction with the Mass Association of School Committees. It was really informative. We sat for eight hours in addition to our regular regularly scheduled school committee meetings. We met on off nights and had uh, three sessions of, of close to three hours apiece where we were able to kind of hash things out and, and state quite bluntly what we wanted to see the school committee do, how could we have a unified direction to take, what we wanted to do about the superintendent's evaluation. And I have to say that working together in those workshops was fantastic because we now have um, a superintendent's evaluation tool that will be ready for the next time Dr. Latham has to be evaluated. Everybody's in agreement on it, including the superintendent. It appears to be fair and it appears to be comprehensive. We have been treating the vegetation at Lax and Sluice Pond. This has been an ongoing and cyclical pro problem for those Ward 1 ponds. Because what would happen is they'd scrounge up money somewhere. Sometimes the um, water and sewer would have some money. Sometimes DPW would have some money. So, you know, community development can't use the money because it has to be in um, certain areas of the city and Ward 1 didn't qualify for community development money. And it became extremely frustrating because if we missed a year, with the, the vegetation control, we had twice as much to do the next year. So it seems silly not to have a permanent source of funding for the, the weed control at those two ponds. So last year and continuing again this year, we've allocated $25,000 out of the mayor's budget because that way nobody can cut it on me. It's, it's in my budget um, to continue with an ongoing preventative uh, weed control program at Flax and Sluice, and this year we are expanding it to include Floating Bridge Pond as well because that was getting a little messy. Um, I guess I'll wrap up with something that has been annoying to many of us for many, many years. The Pink Bridge. <laughs> if you want me to mention rats, though, um, we have added, <laughs> now that you mention rats, um, we have added in this year's budget for FY14, so beginning July 1st, we will have another part-time health inspector coming on to help with the um, rodent problems. In addition to that, we've changed the way that we send people out on these rodent control problems. In the past, the rat guy, Jim Wilson, God love him, um, the rat guy and the exterminator would go out um, to complaints together. 
and Jim would go and look and evaluate the situation and if any eradication was needed, the exterminator stayed behind and did it and Jim would wait with him and then they'd go on to the next problem. But now what Mike has instituted, Mike Donovan from the ISD, is he is sending Jim out first to inspect. If there is a problem, it gets put onto a list for the exterminator and then the rat inspector goes on, the health inspector, goes on to a second property. And then the, if that is deemed to be a problem, that goes on the list. And the exterminator follows behind. So now with the two part-time inspectors, we should be able to cover more ground than we had been in the past. So um, that's the update on the rat control. Again, trash ordinance is going to go a long way toward helping that problem as well. Um, but that we don't have yet. So anyway, what I was going to talk about, see, I thought, I thought this was the, the biggest problem in Lynn to a lot of people, was the pink bridge. Remember our ugly pink bridge downtown? Did anybody notice it? It's painted brown now. <laughs> I hope you like the brown better. And, and you know, I've heard more complaints about that pink bridge. It's brown, brown. I'd call it brown. <laughs> what color is my hair? <laughs> well, anyway, it's not pink anymore. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, perfect thing about you can't please everybody, somebody came to me and said, why'd you paint the pink bridge? I love the pink bridge. But I have to say, we got far more positives about the dark colored bridge than we, we ever did about the pink bridge. So in a nutshell, that is what is going on and has been going on in the city over the last year. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Yes, Lee, ma'am. I recently got my auto renewal insurance policy and I looked at it and I called Liberty Mutual a lot and I said, I had no accidents, no incidents. Why is it in the last two years my policy goes up a couple hundred dollars? She says, she says you're unfortunate enough to live in land. Now you tell me crime rates going down? Nobody else thinks so. You can check it on the website, ma'am. What I good does it do when my insurance goes up like crazy? Well, you're not doing enough, obviously. When people at Lynn, at Union Hospital, when the nurse said to me, don't ever walk downtown at night. I think there are a lot of people in this room that would disagree with you about the ability well, to walk down the don't. Planet. Many, many people who aren't here don't. Well, I the think crime rate is downtown. terrible. I think they haven't visited downtown in a while, perhaps, because when I go downtown at night now... They're not just downtown. You've got areas in this city nobody dares go to. You've got a crime rate problem. You pick up the paper and there's a stabbing or a shooting. What are you doing about those people? I've told you I increased the number of police officers. We have 193 today. I have CLTs. Do they, in, do they put them in jail where they belong? Do they give in, do anything about that? Or do they just wrap them on the wrist and send them back out? So that's up, up to the police department, depending on the and crime the and the officer. No, the police, it's your police department. I wish I had never built a house in this city 60 odd years ago. I've got a five-room house and I'm paying a $4,000 real estate tax. Uh, I'd just like to comment on that. Just FYI, I think Liberty Mutual is a very expensive insurance company. You might There's want to no consider, more expensive well, than consider than Geico. Geico. They do a very, they've, they've got really good rates for this area. You just might want to give them a call. Just well, to help. Because of my home and everything else, I get very good okay. rates. Okay. And so I, I just thought never that. had problems and I have a lot of discounts. Okay. But it's still the auto, the auto insurance went up. I mean, because mine went down in half last this last year, right? this last year. I switched to Geico. Where do you live? Uh, on the corner of Ocean. Oh, well, well, well you here. might have maybe you lowered your coverage, but my coverage stays the same. So I my question coverage. would be, how much she has to lower the crime rate? I don't to, for know. For insurance to, to get one, it. it because it's my the have to go out and pay for these things. <coughs> All right. I think we need to, to move on to the next question. Um, can you comment on the rumor that recently there was a civil rights case uh, settled by the city against the church on Anchor Road? 
I had to sign a confidentiality agreement regarding the settlement. Um, I can tell you that the settlement was six figures. It was not taken out of the city budget. The city had insurance to cover that settlement amount. Um, but the, the church is now being used for, for worship and for services. Um, and other than that, I, I really can't comment on it. I think I've heard some of the rumors around town and um, most of what I've heard has been pretty accurate, but that's really all I can say without, without violating um, the confidentiality agreement that I had to sign. Um, you talk about the downtown area, and I know that, you know, with Minots, I know Seth and Corey, and a lot of the folks that have been working to make that area nice. But boy, when you go up Union Street, it really looks terrible. It's just half the businesses are closed and boarded up. Are there any plans to try to make it more welcoming? And, I mean, back in the day, that was the place to be, was on Union Street and all the stores. Yeah. Well, first of all, what we started um, this past summer, last summer, was an even odd street sweeping program so that we could get more of the trash off the streets. And I, I think you'll acknowledge that the streets are a lot cleaner than they have been in years past because we've been able to get the cars to move to one side or another in order to do a full sweeping every two days. Um, as far as what's going on downtown, we do have, as I said, North Shore Community College coming in. They're going to be expanding their campus onto, um, it's the old Eastern Bank building, and uh, they will have a good number of students over there on a daily basis. They also are planning on having night classes, so that should bring a little more life to downtown. There are also some plans from the Housing Authority to put in a couple of more infill houses up at the upper end of Union Street. Um, other than that, all I can tell you is that slowly but surely there are businesses coming into the downtown area, not necessarily on Union Street, but we've had four, there are now four restaurants in a row on Oxford Street. We have the two coming in, Dimitri and Rossetti's on uh, Sutton Street, and I think as you get those little concentrations of areas to eat, it's going to necessarily be expanding into more of the core of downtown, which would include Union Street. Hopefully that happens. No immediate plan. I, I mean, I, I think, honestly, if you look at the way, th there are very few independently owned movie theaters these days. And the way that, that the big corporations tend to cite them is right on major highways. You know, if you think about Revere, you think about Danvers, you think about um, Burlington, they're all with... If, if somebody wanted to use the site for that, I would certainly encourage it. Um, there's been some talk about another food retail establishment going into Johnny's Food Master. It just hasn't been finalized yet. Um, and there's also some talk about the old Sir Speedy over on um, Court Street, which is right behind City Hall. That may be turning into a, a food retail establishment as well. Um, but there's just a lot of these plans are preliminary right now, so I can't really talk about them with any definity in, in, until we have something more concrete in place. Yes? I may be able to ask this question, but like, I remember when I was, my dad told me when he was, actually, this is when I was two or three, and the mayor of the was then he banned me to avoid the poor school voting. And like, I, I believe it should be for that. And are, do, are you for or opposed, you, are you for or opposing the voting the poor schools? I've already said that I would have no objection to opening up the Ford School for voting. It is the city council that sets the polling places. But I would have no objection if they were to, um, what they do is they establish by a council vote before every election where the polling places will be held. And if they were to send me a list of polling places that includes the Ford School, I would happily sign it. Because I remember they said it wasn't, when the last thing they got, they said it was in the traffic I have, my dad has no problem going up the stairs. I definitely don't have any problem going up the stairs. The wheelchair is not a problem. This, this has been an ongoing debate for years and years and years, and I have consistently said, 
I would have no problem. It is the city council that has to set the polling places. All right. Um, who else did I see in the back? Yeah, it's, it should be open by next year. We're, we're now in the final phase and everything has been funded. So, um, you know, pretty soon maybe we'll have two boats going back and forth out of Lynn Harbor, the ferry and the, the Aquacino. I don't know if any of you saw that, but the, there is a casino boat back in town. They're supposed to be starting their first trip June 14th. Um, I've been on a tour of it. It's very nice. It's much bigger than the old boat had been. It has elevators in there. Um, and, you know, it'd be nice to have a little fleet going out of Lynn Harbor. That and John's fishing boat. And we have a little trio. Pat? Uh, update on the waterfront. What's happening there? I've heard things, but. Well, um, that land down on the South Harbor is still being looked at by the foreign investors. They are going to be in town next week, Jamie? Next week. So I will be meeting with them. That is not a dead deal yet. Obviously, with the number of different owners over there, a lot of privately owned parcels, it's a very complicated <laughs> um, deal to put together. Um, they originally were working with a, um, an analyst out of New York City and found that uh, they needed somebody with more local knowledge, so they switched, and now they have an analyst from Boston who's been going through and seeing what the viability is of, of that site for the proposed particular use. Um, but this company is one of the largest in the world that, that is backing this financially. So um, I don't think it's going to be a question of them finding financing for it. I think it's a question of whether it's going to be profitable for them. But um, we are meeting with them next week. In fact, hey, Kennedy, what is the standing of the uh, up on building in the Vegas building downtown? It's short up. Um, the land that any, we... Any, any word about the ACA or selling the site? Well, the EDIC did a um, report, um, did some sample soil testing over in their parking lot, and it's pretty heavily contaminated. Um, one of the problems with remediating just that parking lot is that the contamination started from the old White's Laundry up on Willow Street, and the flow of the water, the flow of anything is toward the ocean. So it started at White's, ran across Willow Street, and ran across uh, underneath the Hawthorne's parking lot. I have met with the Hawthorne family and their advisors a couple of times. I've seen some conceptual plans. Um, they don't really have any interest in getting it sold or developing it right at We could try to take it by eminent domain, but I have to say the Athenas family has probably hundreds of millions of dollars, at least tens of millions of dollars, and I personally would rather be working with them and getting them, they shorted up, I mean, it's not a hazard anymore as it was a while ago, um, but I would rather work with them than to try to take it from them because that would just involve Lynn in a very costly, uh, Court suit, a suit that would take years and years. So, yes. Have you heard that the um, Federal Street property owned by GE was contaminated when they were looking at it for site for plastic? Why would they put a food store on that same line? They have been doing remediation at that site for years now, and th it's all overseen by the Mass DEP. And once the DEP is satisfied that it has been cleaned up to a level of usefulness, they issue what they call um, a final report. And the final report came through in the fall of last year that said it had been cleaned up to the point where it could be used for a variety of uses and a food, a food retail establishment was one of the acceptable uses. Um, this is not the city making this determination. It is the DEP making that determination. There's one part of the land that was still not cleaned up um, to that high level of use, and that is in the corner over by Waterhill Street, um, um, Spencer Street, 
where, kind of where the old neighborhood factory is, um, that little corner is not up to the standards of the rest of the um, property. So that will be part of the parking lot. You won't see the, the store on that part of the land. Do you have any questions anymore? As valuable as the housing stock in Concord or Newton. So, I mean, it, it, there's only so much land we have here in Lynn to be able to extract property taxes from. I mean, and as I said, the average single family home um, property tax bill actually went down this year. Did the rate go up? Maybe that's it. Mine went down. But I can tell you, part, part of it is some of the benefits that have been worked into the union contracts, some of them were placed there by, by city ordinance. And one of them that I fought against vehemently was the education incentive um, that was passed by the city council maybe 10 or 12 years ago. That allows city department heads up to 25% bonus on their base salary each and every year if they have a degree. And I thought that was kind of double dipping, not, not in a, a manner that is not permitted, but it's permissible double dipping. Because if the city sets, for example, the city solicitor's office at a particular salary, one would assume that the city solicitor, as a prerequisite to being in that position, would have a law degree. But the way this ordinance is written, now they're getting 25% on top of that. And I think if we got rid of the education incentive, you'd see a huge drop in the compensation. It's not up to me. The city council is the one that's, that passes the ordinances. Um, it is ordinance, current ordinance, so it is therefore law right now. There's, there's no, I don't think there's any um, wish on, on the part of the city council to undo that. But what our charter calls for is for the city council to review and determine the rate at which department heads are going to be paid in the city of Lynn. And instead, we just have this automatic 25% bonus that goes on each and every year for department heads, or up to 25%. If you have a bachelor's degree, it's 20%. If you have an associate's degree, I think it's 10 or 15%. But that's a lot of extra money going out of the city treasury. Pat? It's election time coming up. And uh, so the question would be, what would be your vision or plan uh, for a second term? Or what would, you, what would be some of your objectives that you want to get done second well, time around? I think we're moving in the right direction. I like the fact that we are seeing businesses come into Lynn. And it has been pretty substantial in the last couple of years, and even in the last year, with the Market Basket, with the Kettle Cuisine, with the Rosettis, with the Demichis, and that is because they are seeing Lynn as a good investment opportunity. And it wasn't like that in the past. People were afraid to invest their money in Lynn. And now we're kind of lifting this, this veil, this, this cloud that has been hanging over the city of Lynn, and we're becoming a little more comfortable in our own skin, I think, as a city. Um, and with that, comes a certain amount of confidence. And with the confidence here, in addition to the increase in public safety, which has driven out quite a number of the gang members, by the way, we've gone from about 1,200 gang members a couple of years ago down to about 350 known gang members today. So I think that outsiders are seeing that. They're not as afraid to come to Lynn. They're not afraid to go downtown at night. They're not afraid to walk around the city. And I think that that makes us a more welcoming place for them to do business. I would like to continue that. I would also like to continue with the transparency, having everything on TV, the city council and the school committee, having use of online. We've been moving toward some renewals that are available for, for uh, doing online. I'd like to expand that program some more. I would like to see the Thurgood Marshall Middle School built, then go on to the Pickering Middle School. We also have further down the pipeline, Cobbett, Tracy, and Rick, what's the third one? 
Cobbett and Tracy and Pickering and, and Marshall. But the, city co the, the school committee wants to put together a long-term capital plan so that once we get the funding for Pickering, we're then ready to jump right on that because our schools certainly um, are in bad, bad shape. And I told you about the millions of dollars that have put into them over the last year. Uh, eventually, they're old buildings and they're tired and they will give out. And that's why it's so important to have that pipeline going. Um, but I do feel as though the city is on the right track. Using the auditorium to bring people in here has been of great financial benefit. I think whether or not Suffolk Downs gets a casino is going to have a huge impact on the direction that the city goes. Because if Suffolk Downs is chosen as a casino site, I think you'll see a hotel on the Linway, without a doubt. I mean, I think it makes it most probable that there would be a hotel on the Linway. Without the casino going in, that still remains up in the air. I would still like to see a hotel servicing the eighth largest city in Massachusetts. One of the problems with that type of development and waiting on Suffolk Downs is that the gentleman who owns the biggest parcel of land on the South Harbor also holds a huge stake in Suffolk Downs. So he's not going to be doing much with that parcel until he sees what's going on with his other parcel. So there are a lot of moving parts, but I think we're lining up the people, the investors, so that we will be able to get things developed once they move off the stick on Suffolk Downs. Okay. Yes, Mary. Hi. Um, I'm curious. I know that I believe it was last year the state of the city you told us that you had just hired a grant writer. Yes. And now I understand that we no longer have a grant writer. Yeah. And I was wondering what your intentions are as far as pursuing that. I guess the best way to put it is back to the drawing board because we did have a grant writer for nine months. Um, we found people to be very territorial in their grant writing. For example, the schools already have a full-time grant writer, so there were no school grants that, that our grant writer was able to participate in. The police have their own grant writer, um, Deputy Chief Santoro, so he didn't want to have the grant writer helping him out. Same thing over at the fire department, community development, economic development, they all had their own grant writers. And part of the compensation structure for the grant writer was if he wrote a grant and it came in, based upon the amount of money that he brought in, he had bonuses that he could, could attain. But he got a grant that had been given two years earlier to somebody else, they would say, no, no, you can't get the credit for that because we got it two years ago, they already knew about us. And it got to the point where it was very difficult to compensate him in a way that, that wasn't very cloudy. So he left in January and we've, we've still had plenty of grants coming in. In fact, most recently we got a $400,000 grant for McManus Field. Um, and that partnered with the $400,000 in the bond is going to be used, at least the, the plan calls for it right now, is to put a, um, right near the skate park, to put another splash pad to have the inner city kids um, come in. The bandstand money that I told you about came in from a grant. The Mass, Mass in Motion gave us a $240,000 grant to encourage healthy habits in the city and to put those mile markers around the city. Um, the police have gotten, plenty of grants, um, which has enabled us to maintain the hiring that we've been doing. The fire department just got a $300,000 public safety grant um, to, to distribute smoke detectors, to um, get their Scott packs replaced. So there are grants coming in, even without the grant writer. Um, I don't want anybody to think that because we don't have the grant writer, we don't have grants coming in. Because they are, it just seems to be very decentralized in the city of Lynn, and there didn't seem to be too much of a desire to bring it into one central location. I mean, that's the, the long and the short of it. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for having me here today. Hope to see you next year.